right uh, moment. Uh, so if I may, uh, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me all welcome you in the Chamber of Deputies of, of the Parliament of the Czech Republic. It's my honor to be with you right now, right here. I would like to thank the organizers from the Prague Security uh, Studies Institute, the Uyghur Human Rights Project, and the Forum for Human Rights for their great work. Uh, so let me thank you all for coming and participating at this event. I understand that the forced labor is a global problem. According to an ILO estimate, there are currently around 27 million people in forced labor. Yet, I would like to focus on the particular issue of the Uyghurs. Because in their case, the forced labor amounts to a modern day slavery and is part of a systematic effort by the Chinese regime. It might be shocking for many of us who only know slavery from historical books and films, but not only that it still exists, it is even worse as it is a part of the supply chain that brings the products such like, uh, like cars, t-shirts or computers to the stores in our country or elsewhere in Europe or the United States. This is a huge problem for many reasons. First, it is a moral problem. Being complicit to forced labor or slavery as consumers or bystanders is simply morally wrong and unacceptable. It is against our basic values and principles. Regardless of cultural and social differences, the individual rights and freedoms are universal and must therefore be protected and promoted. If we do not uphold them in one case, it is very likely that the insolence of the oppressors will only grow. Second, it is a practical problem. It might sound cynically, but for the strictly economic point of view, the forced labor is an unfair economic practice. It is horrible and repulsive in itself, but it also harms our own economies. Last but not least, it is an existential problem for the Uyghurs and other Muslims in the Xinjiang region. Because forced labor is a part of a systematic effort to change the demography of the region and to weaken the identity of Uyghurs and other Muslim nations. The de facto slavery is only one part of a plan to subdue the Muslim population in China. This plan also consists of other horrendous repressive actions like arbitrary detentions, forced indoctrinations, torture, or sterilization. I have read the story of Ms. Zumrat Davut, who was detained in 2018 in the town of Urumqi for no obvious reason. She then spent several months in prison, was humiliated, and had to promise to stop practicing her religion. Afterwards, she was forced to undergo a sterilization surgery. She now lives in the US with her family. Others are less lucky. Around one million of Uyghurs and other Muslims are in uh, detention camps, and many more work as slaves in farms and factories. I'm glad that the US, the EU, and other important players have adopted, or are about to adopt, important pieces of legislation. Legislation that will limit the profits of the companies that use forced labor, whether directly or indirectly. However, this is not the end, but rather the beginning of a long way forward. 
because the greed and indifference will complicate the implementation of the anti-forced labor instruments. And we have to keep up our effort and pressure for the sake of the eradication of the forced labor. In Xinjiang and everywhere as well, the Czech Republic with its value-based foreign policy, with, which is built on the legacy of Václav Havel, should definitely take a leadership role. Thank you very much for your attention and for participating in this event. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words and for your support. Uh, we really appreciate this. Uh, thank you also for being um, kind with the uh, auspices and, and to host the event. Uh, and now I will uh, give the floor to, the, to Roger Robinson, uh, the chairman and co-founder of uh, Prague Security Studies Institute. Well, thank you very much, Aveta, and uh, our sincere thanks to the speaker for her auspices and these uh, august gatherings for a session of great importance. And that is uh, one of the central human rights abuses of our time, uh, the trafficking in, in forced labor. And uh, we have, uh, at PSSI, over now more than 20 years been dedicated to the human rights portfolio as well as national security and we are uh, rather single-mindedly focused on China and Russia in this regard despite the fact that we do a lot of work in the Western Balkans and disinformation issues and a range of others uh, <coughs> our main areas of emphasis are uh, economic and financial statecraft read warfare, and, uh, <clears throat> and space security. So uh, leave it to say that we're honored to be part of this event today, and I thank my fellow co-organizers, uh, and it has been a steady effort to try to get our arms around uh, this, uh, this particular uh, heinous abuse. Uh, we were very gratified on the one hand to see the uh, European Commission uh, take on this issue and uh, propose legislation uh, to do something about products made with forced labor. And <clears throat> we're encouraged and we certainly believe that uh, a list of products to be excluded from EU markets is the right way to go uh, on the one hand, but we do see some rather glaring shortfalls in that enterprise that we're hoping uh, can be remedied during this period of deliberation. And I think the two issues that we're uh, most concerned about, and we spent the morning uh, talking over with a number of folks here and others that joined us, uh, <coughs> is, the, is the fact that uh, in addition to naming products and the tough job of national authorities in be being able to prove the case for forced labor, which is quite unlike the American legislation, which puts that burden of proof on the importer. And uh, that gives us a lot more confidence that something's going to happen. Uh, finding forensic proof is a tough undertaking, and lawyers are involved, litigation could be involved, and it's uh, elusive, might be a polite way to put it. And we're concerned about that uh, particular event. But we're more concerned about the fact that products don't produce products. Uh, products don't make a decision to employ forced labor. It's companies that do that. Uh, and it's the companies that right now are not scheduled to be named who are the perpetrators of, uh, of forced labor. And uh, in that connection, uh, China being the principal global offender, 
of trafficking in forced labor uh, has been the focus of our attention. And there, uh, together with a, a partner organization in the United States called the Coalition for a Prosperous America, an extensive amount of research has been done, the results of which we distributed today for the first time, which is 50 large Chinese companies, all publicly traded, which is a new dimension to this debate that we'll be getting into in just a moment. And where those stocks and bonds of those companies are being held, by what indexes, what investment products of the Black Rocks and the, uh, and the other big players like Vanguard and State Street in the United States, and their European equivalents. Because the sad truth is that scores of millions of Americans, and certainly tens of millions of unwitting Europeans, are holding the securities, read stocks and bonds, of forced labor offenders from China. That's just an empirical fact. And sadly, we found that virtually all of those 50 companies are in the portfolios of Americans and or Europeans uh, as we speak today. So we think that there need to be penalties that China actually fears. And believe me when I tell you that of all the subjects that they've confronted in the past that are economic and financial, non-military, I would put the money at the top of the list. The capital markets have never seen the light of day in this kind of policy context. We believe that they represent, uh, that is the sanction of access to European and American capital markets, represents the most powerful source of leverage ever brought to bear uh, in our mutual effort to advance the cause of human rights, period. Now that is our, our position on the matter and it's because hundreds of billions of dollars, indeed trillions of dollars are implicated in this debate and China simply has to have access to those hundreds of billions each year in order to maintain anything approaching a viable growth rate and hence uh, the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, we have the money, they don't. Uh, we have the vast majority of investable capital, uh, they don't. Uh, we have the world's reserve currencies, uh, <coughs> their currencies non-convertible. Uh, the dollar, of course, being the premier uh, <coughs> world reserve currency. So leave it to say that, that we, the allies, and particularly the United States in this regard, utterly dominate the global financial domain on this planet. And it is, as I said, a very powerful source of leverage. Uh, there's been a lot of lobbying by Wall Street and its European equivalents not to go down this road. A lot of companies and businesses are low to name Chinese companies because it could do something uh, to, to damage BMW and Airbus sales and the list goes on. So believe me, this is a very tough road politically in some ways because the momentum to keep China in those supply chains is very real. And we have it in the United States as well. Although we're encouraged by the fact that in the Congress of the United States, uh, your counterpart uh, here is, has a unique, uh, almost unprecedented bipartisan consensus on China. And to be specific, a, a, an anti-China uh, sentiment that has been well earned uh, by Beijing and finally has penetrated the consciousness of American policymakers on both sides of the aisle. 
So we're more encouraged that serious sanctions uh, can finally be brought to bear in the effort to advance human rights. We want to begin that here uh, with the legislative initiative on forced labor as one of the touchstones to work with, as well as the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act in the United States, which likewise needs to be augmented and enhanced for the simple reason we don't name Chinese companies either. Again, it's products only. And nobody ever thought about the glaring inconsistency of, on the one hand, calling uh, the forced labor practices utterly unacceptable, modern slavery, uh, and at the, uh, at the same time rewarding the corporate perpetrators of forced labor by having them uh, gain all of the advantages of raising funds, large funds, billions, tens of billions of dollars a year in our capital markets, but also the prestige of participating in those capital markets because China uses it as a kind of good housekeeping seal of approval that tells the rest of the world, wittingly or unwittingly, sends a signal that it's okay to do business with egregious human rights abusers. It's okay to deal with sanctioned Chinese companies who have been violating our most vital national security concerns, militarizing those islands in the South China Sea, building advanced weapon systems for the PLA. That list is a long one too, along with aiding and abetting genocide, equipping concentration camps, building the surveillance state, not to mention trafficking in forced labor. So this is the challenge ahead, and trillions of dollars have moved from the investment portfolios and hard-earned retirement accounts of Europeans and Americans into the coffers of the Chinese Communist Party and its corporate proxies on a daily basis. And that's where we are right now. So we're very hopeful that we can use this roundtable, uh, proceedings like this one, but also the action-forcing event represented by the legislative initiative taken by the EC that's currently uh, in discussion and see if we can't exact real penalties this time, stop that glaring inconsistency of on the one hand uh, feeling that we can't live with forced labor offenders, corporate or otherwise, but at the same time funding those same offenders simultaneously. So that's the nature of the discussion that took place this morning that many of you may have missed, but we'll be writing up under the Chatham House rule, but nevertheless we'll be summarizing all of those very rich, very textured discussions of this morning and being able to share a good deal of that with you this afternoon. And again, we just feel that this is a moment in time that is historic, a crossroads, if you will, because China has sloughed off sanctions long enough. They have not really had the grip, the force, and the fear that's required for them to actually act in backing off some of these heinous practices. We think we can change it. We think we have had a breakthrough here of monumental importance. And we'd like to share that with you, see what you think, and engage in a spirited dialogue about all of this. So with that, I'll just uh, thank you all again. and. Uh, We'll proceed with the panel. Thank you. Indeed, uh, Mr. Robinson, for those remarks. Uh, Madam Speaker Pekarova, thank you very much indeed for having us here, for hosting us, distinguished panelists and distinguished guests and friends. It's my pleasure to introduce 
our panel today. Um, may I just add your clear and powerful description and articulation of the problem we all face uh, was extraordinarily uh, strong, uh, extremely powerful. I know that your words will resonate uh, with us and they serve in the, as an example to speakers around the world. Although I, I think I can say, as somebody coming from the UK, that you have a like-minded speaker in Sir Lindsay Hoyle. Um, okay, so what I'm hoping to do uh, today in this panel is to give an opportunity for a discussion. Uh, we have a very broad subject matter before us today. We're talking about capital markets, we're talking about supply chain transparency and different models in trying to raise standards around modern slavery in the northwest of China. Um, and there are lots of ways of approaching that. So we have a very distinguished panel before us today who are going to approach those questions from their own angles. And then, after some questions which I will pose to the panelists, I will open the floor for your questions. So please, as everybody is speaking, uh, please do be thinking of questions that you would like to put to the panel so we can have as participatory and as rich a discussion as possible. Uh, briefly introducing our speakers uh, today, we're very privileged to have with us Eva de Croix, who is a member of the Chamber of Deputies of the Parliament of the Czech Republic. Uh, she is also the successor to uh, Jan Lipavsky as co-chair of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, which is the organization that I founded and, and tried to run. Uh, we also have uh, Louisa Greve, who is Director of Global Advocacy for the Uyghur Human Rights Project, very well known to all of those who have been trying to defend the rights of the Uyghur people around the world. And we have uh, Mr. Roger Robinson, who is chairman and co-founder of the Prague Security Studies Institute and whom you've just heard from. So before I invite our panelists each to give some introductory comments, I just wanted to tell a brief story. Um, I didn't get into China issues uh, for strong ideological reasons. I got into China issues through the lens of modern slavery. I founded an institution called Arise in 2015, which has grown into an international anti-slavery charity, a grassroots charity working in countries from where people are trafficked. In about 2017, uh, I became more aware of the problem of state-sponsored slavery in China and started to ask why it was that other NGOs, other anti-slavery NGOs, were not saying anything about it. We worked very hard in order to raise awareness. We tried to get the CEOs of the really big NGOs to speak, and they wouldn't. And then somebody said to me, follow the money. So I started to look to who the key philanthropist was who had seed funded a lot of the largest anti-slavery organizations in the world. Now, this is a man named Andrew Forrest, who, to his great credit, has given hundreds of millions of Australian dollars to fight slavery. But his mining business relies almost entirely upon Chinese acquiescence through his supply chains. Uh, he's known to be very close to the Chinese government, and the institutions that he'd founded did not want to speak about human rights abuses in China, no matter how hard we tried. Now, that has changed now, because public pressure was so big that I think it was simply too embarrassing for those anti-slavery organizations to be silent. But I raise this as an example to show how deep and how pervasive the influence of the People's Republic of China is. It goes even in to the anti-slavery NGO community, and it succeeds in silencing those people from speaking out. That is the depth, uh, that's the breadth of the influence, and that's the nature of, of the challenge that we all face. So that's just my own personal story. It was frustration with that that led me to try to develop a coalition of parliamentarians to concentrate on China issues more broadly, and a lot of the work that we have done <laughs> has focused on the human rights crisis in Northwest China. Um, I'm pleased to say that having started with co-chairs from left and right parties in eight countries, the Interparliamentary Alliance on China is now uh, in 30 legislatures around the world and numbers around 260 members of parliament. So you're not alone in your fight um, and there is a lot of consensus across geographical and ideological boundaries. We can take some comfort from that.
So with that, I am delighted to introduce uh, my friend and a wonderful advocate for all of these issues, uh, Eva de Croix, to give us her first opening statement. Eva. Thank you very much. I will stay uh, sitting here in order to make a feeling of the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Luke. Uh, thank you for this uh, lovely introductory and uh, your story. Uh, thank you also uh, not only to this organizer and Iveta, but all these organizations, uh, including uh, 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 people uh, sitting here around me, opening and discussing this subject. Uh, uh, and uh, my first uh, thought, uh, uh, very often uh, when I think about the uh, Uyghur issue, it's uh, we are here in the middle of the Europe, and uh, the day after 70 years, as societies, we are still struggling to cope with our past concerning Holocaust. And Holocaust concerned in the past at about, uh, at least uh, concerning their lives, uh, 10 million people, maybe more in everyday life. And still, I think it's very heavy for us. We still, really to we still struggle to understand how we were able to allow it. But even in the same days when we are uh, celebrating this memory, in the same days, somewhere other, maybe uh, far from here, the story is happening to other millions of people this time it's not Jewish population, it's Muslim population, but there are 70, there are 20 millions of them, and uh, we don't know how much of them it does cost already the life. We know that uh, many of them are still in the concentration camps. Many of them, they have to work uh, under the conditions which were described uh, today. And uh, I think that the only way, if really we here in Europe or in other uh, Western democracies, uh, we want to be able to live with us, to really uh, declare and live the values uh, we have in our constitution, that we cannot, we cannot uh, close eyes and uh, live our everyday life. Uh, there is a progress in this issue. Uh, since uh, 20 years, uh, it started on European level, on, on some national levels, uh, uh, starting with uh, declaration of inhuman conditions. After that uh, came uh, a condemnation of religious repression. Uh, finally, uh, I think uh, 10 years ago, uh, we started to speak about uh, crimes against humanity. Today, we dare to open also the term of genocide. So we see that uh, the Western democracies are aware of what is happening. But this is only one part of our uh, liability of uh, what we have to do, because this is only declaration. If we declare that somewhere genocide is happening, and I think it's really important to, to be aware of what is in the world genocide. It's, it's the worst crime on the world. We cannot only stay with the declaration. So. Uh, this conference uh, in this regard is very important because we do not stay only on the declaration of genocide. We do not want to be only sentimental politics. We only want to take our real steps. Uh, we see in the States that real steps are possible. Today, I think we are looking for our path in Europe. Uh, maybe it's slower than I would like uh, that to, to be. Uh, but we have a really great, great advantage, a great tool to do it, because the unique market does concern at about uh, 450 million of people. So if, uh, and I heard it uh, from Luke, uh, if we have to follow this meaning, follow the money, this is our uh, really uh, strength, this is something we may we have to use uh, this unique market. And we have already the regulations and we have already the mechanism how to uh, avoid uh, unfair competition. Mrs. Speaker, she, she noted it, because unfair competition does not concern only anti-dumping uh, regulation or uh, foreign subsidies uh, uh, regulation. Because all these uh, mechanisms 
up to now concern only uh, how it was financed. But now, this is like commercial level, I think we need to go forward and we need also to ask ourselves who produced it, not only how it was financed. So we need to shift our uh, European mechanism from commercial level to the political level. Because political level, it's the, it's the place, it's, the, it's, the, it's our obligation to incorporate in, into this legislation the values. So the, modern, the forced labor, modern slavery, human trafficking, but also a child labor, which is inside all of these terms, uh, are not only about commercial level, are not only about competition, are about political will, but also about political courage. Uh, I tried to discover what's happening now concretely on European Commission uh, with uh, this directive. Uh, all the answers were quite vague, uh, like uh, we discuss it. So uh, uh, I hope that also this event uh, will maybe uh, push forward the discussion, will uh, suggest concrete uh, issues uh, concerning the capital market as well. And uh, I would like also mention other mean. We have already available at its Magnitsky Act. Our Republic adopted it already. But today we use it much more concerning Russia and Ukraine, which is of course important. But concerning Uyghur, as Xinjiang, uh, Europe, not Czech Republic, Europe, Europe up to now sanctioned, up, what, at least what I know, only four person. But when we compare what is happening with Uyghur and how many people were sanctioned, it's completely disbalanced. So uh, yes, on one hand, we need, we need to look for new tools. We need to put on a way new mechanism. On the other way, we, we have already tools which might be used if there is a political courage and also, of course, political will. I'm uh, uh, proud of the Czech Republic today declare this political will, declare this political courage. I think there is no better testimony of this than the presence uh, of our speaker of assembly here. Thank you for it. And, uh, of course, the, the battle, it's not finished today. We have in front of us European election, and uh, this is maybe also the place and the moment uh, during which all of us, we have to ask ourselves uh, who will be able to uh, support this uh, burden of the political courage in the future uh, in front of China, because uh, I think it would be uh, it would be forced to think that uh, any kind of this legislation or any kind of this mechanism or regulation we speak about will not uh, be uh, survived. Uh, will there will be no reaction from China? Of course, there will be. And we know uh, that uh, everything we did up to now uh, against China had a very, uh, very strong reaction from their part. So, uh, of course, that if we want to uh, uh, adopt this legislation uh, and implement it, not only adopt it, uh, we need uh, also on European level uh, to have uh, leaders uh, who are able to support it. Uh, on the last, uh, for uh, to conclude, I would like to mention also our national level, because it's not only on European uh, uh, everything uh, on national level, uh, I have only mentioned that uh, our today uh, political representation uh, is and I hope will still be uh, on leadership uh, and I'm always happy uh, to hear Luke uh, to mention it, the Czech Republic is on many uh, aspects today, uh, example uh, showing uh, how to do it towards China. Uh, I'm also uh, very uh, proud that uh, the uh, human rights uh, are issue very broadly discussed here. 
Uh, here in assembly, uh, we have uh, founded a subcommittee for human rights, which is an excellent platform, for example, to make a public hearing for, of Uyghurs, which I did already. I have uh, the honor to chair this subcommission because uh, all these mechanisms, regulation, legislation I spoke about, uh, there need the one prerequis prerequisite condition, and this is the public pressure. It was mentioned here already, because it's only the, when the people, our population, will be aware of what's happening, how disastrous is for our morality, for our values, and they will really make this public pressure, we will succeed to adopt this legislation. So I hope that uh, we will really, and uh, I really like uh, this, uh, this uh, point, that uh, the public pressure should be so huge and important that in the future it will be embarrassing for the companies, for the European companies, to follow co cooperation uh, with these uh, Chinese, uh, or Chinese authorities, because, uh, yeah, it's Chinese authorities uh, supporting this uh, forced labor. Uh, and uh, I hope that maybe also uh, our, our meeting uh, will open and will support this uh, embarrassing hearing uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you for the focus on uh, values, particularly paraphrasing from another participant this morning. Um, they said something along the lines of uh, failure to protect our values uh, undermines the foundation stone of our very identity. Uh, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that we are at the moment in a, 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 a battle, certainly within Europe, over how we construe values within foreign policy. Thanks also for mentioning about concrete outcomes. Um, and for cracking the whip around all of that. We do need concrete outcomes from these conferences, and I think we may already have one from this morning's meeting. Let's hope we can get some more out of this session. Thanks also for the mentions of leadership and the need to increase public pressure, perhaps the hardest thing of all, and I hope that our next panelist might be able to give us some ideas around that. Uh, that's over to you, Louisa, for your introductory comments. Looking forward to hearing from you, thanks. Thank you so much, Luke. Um, I do appreciate uh, putting the uh, Uyghur suffering in the context of modern slavery because that's not exactly how the world's awareness and even the Uyghur diaspora community became aware of us. It was people taken away in the middle of a night, a black hood over their head, and disappeared into camps. And a lot of people, Europeans, Americans, other words, said, oh, do you really mean concentration camps? Um, you know, don't exaggerate, uh, you won't get public sympathy. Well, um, the word concentrated dear, did appear in the Chinese names of the camps. Um, what happened to the people who disappeared? Um, we had uh, an unknown number of deaths, as the delegate has said, still secret. Uh, we had long prison sentences uh, for certain elites of Uyghur society, professors, entrepreneurs, poets. And what about the rest? And um, of course, we have uh, a European Uyghur here, Dolkan Issa, who may um, be able to speak to um, what he does and doesn't know about his own family members. But one of the major dispositions of the survivors of that in initial chaotic an utterly brutal roundup of people on the basis of ethnic religious identity. We say it's the largest such roundup since World War II, targeting of a, a people on their ethno-religious identity. Um, it is forced labor. And so in many ways, I'd like to point out the ways that forced labor is the current tool of the ongoing genocide. So this is not a side issue. It's not just a way to hook European values to a genocide. It actually is central in China's policy. Um, one, it is a state-sponsored forced labor, recall. We're not talking about corruption on the margins of an economy where corrupt officials look the other way for profit. It is a tool of government policy. Um, secondly, it is a tool to break up families and to prevent family formation. When people of marriageable age are sent to worker dormitories and not allowed to go home, or maybe perhaps one visit a week, or if there's taken to another city, uh, perhaps 
one or no visit home in a year, you have prevented family formation, and therefore you've prevented the continuity of an ethnic group um, because you've prevented births to that group. Combined with policies of forced and incentivized marriages, which my organization has uh, documented, um, you, are, you do have a demographic genocide that is carried out through forced labor placement. And recall that the Chinese government um, used to have a policy that every minority, um, I'm putting quotations around the word minority because you may know that Uyghurs say, if you call me a minority, whose minority am I? Uh, Beijing's minority, but this is our homeland. This, we're not a minority, we are who we are. We're our own ethnic group. Um, so to pay respect to Uyghurs, it's wonderful to say I'm the Uyghur people or ethnic group. But Chinese policy says every minority, um, used to be one adult must be in a, a known place of work, right? Which is a way to control people and not allow people to have their own family economies, their own businesses, and so on. Uh, in 2019, so three or four years ago already, the policy changed. Every adult must be in a government assigned place of work, including mothers of young children regardless of the family's wish to stay home, take care of family house, uh, family enterprises, children, elders. Um, this is not allowed. And this truly is the destruction of uh, a community and prevention of uh, the replication of a, an ethnic identity, a nation, and um, a people. So what is our job here? Um, yes, we need to stop complicity from the outside world. Um, and that's allowing trade uh, in the goods that are produced as part of this massive state policy and preventing the flow of capital to the companies, the Chinese so-called private sector companies. Uh, at least they're making profits. Um, I would like to add uh, two other items on the agenda for future discussion. Uh, one is to stand up um, victim-centered responses to this. Yes, let's stop complicity. That'll be a long slog. There will be interest against it. But is anyone standing up to say, is there trauma care provided for those su survivors who have managed to make it to Turkey, who are in Central Asia, Kazakhs, Uzbeks, Kyrgyz, and Uyghurs, people in Europe, people in the US? Uh, as far as I know, there's not a single government program in all the human rights programs that is supporting trauma-informed care for victims and the secondary survivors who are living with the knowledge that I still don't know where my relatives are. Um, and finally, standing up to defend rights on sovereign soil through really having a robust response to transnational rep repression, which keeps the victims from speaking for themselves, keeps the survivors from telling their stories, and is part of the malign influence operations that prevents action on policy questions that ought to be uh, a matter of democratic discussion and are impeded very often uh, by extraterritorial terror reach of repressive tactics of coercion and influence. Um, so those are not unrelated, they're in fact quite closely related. And um, Uyghur organizations like the Uyghur Human Rights Project, like the World Uyghur Congress based here in Munich, um, are asking everyone to please consider all of these policy and, uh, imperatives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louisa. Um, extremely powerful remarks. Thanks for reminding us of the centrality of forced labor to the, z the design of the Chinese Communist Party's crackdown upon ethnic and religious minorities in the Uyghur region. Uh, also, thank you for raising the issue of ongoing care. Um, this is something which, although people have been campaigning for it, has found deaf ears within governments around the world. I've seen no movement whatsoever, even though the need is very great, particularly around, I think, uh, another important point you raised, transnational uh, repression. Uh, I should say to the people in the room that they should expect that in addition to revelations of so-called Chinese overseas police stations in various parts of the world, uh, over the coming month, there will be revelations of many more different types of service stations uh, which are all linked to the activities of the United Front and to which there is no systematic policy response uh, at the moment, or at least not one that's visible. So thank you for reminding us of all of those things. Um, passing on now to our final speaker. Um, over to you, uh, Roger, thank you very much. Thank you, Luke. We're all 
familiar with export controls. And the Czech Republic not long ago instituted screening mechanisms for direct foreign direct investment to ensure that the Chinese are not able to walk away with militarily relevant and other uh, prized technologies of the country. Uh, the United States has had such a screening mechanism for a long time. Uh, the adequacy of it uh, can be debated, and its enforcement uh, pretty shoddy or episodic. So I've got plenty to say about the, the fact that it's an imperfect system, but it beats no system. And it was gratifying to see Europe, rather belatedly, come to the table and recognize the necessity of um, these developments now that China has shown more than abundantly its true colors as a flat-out adversary of democracy. Uh, some would use the term enemy, and uh, certainly uh, many feel that we're in a Cold War initiated by them, ironically, uh, not of our own hawkish making. And I think that's about where we are myself. But uh, leave it to say that there's an area that had no screening and today has no screening and no, uh, no oversight and no diligence performed. And that is having to do with the money. Uh, over the past two decades, uh, China has been entering the United States capital markets, for example, uh, and uh, nobody much cared who. Many of these companies were sanctioned by the United States. Uh, others of them were uh, known egregious human rights abusers. And, uh, and you had others that were national security violators, such as the builders and militarizers of uh, China's illegal islands in the South China Sea and advanced weapon systems for the PLA. It is a long list, and it's not pretty. How many Chinese companies came in, you might ask? Well, try as many as 5,000. Now, only 260 are listed on the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, and they, would, they, they the SEC and others, would have you believe that's the universe of companies in the U.S. cap markets. Well, they conveniently forget the 900 in the over-the-counter market, and they don't pay any attention to the as many as 4,000 A-share companies. Now, these are companies that are only traded on domestic Chinese exchanges, Shenzhen, Shanghai, that are scooped up by MSCI, FTSE Russell, and other index providers, primarily American, scooped up by the hundreds and put on their index list, which are then immediately and with no changes turned into investment products for consumption by the American people, by the Black Rocks and Vanguards, State Street, Fidelity, household names. And do we know that we've been put in these kind of exchange-traded funds and mutual funds and other so-called passive investment vehicles? No clue. No clue. How many Americans are holding sanctioned and other egregious human rights and national security abusers on the corporate side? Well, our estimate's about 150 million. How many Europeans? About the same. About the same. If you have international exposure, they're in your portfolio. It's just about that simple. Heck, we even found them in the federal thrift savings plan to this day. That is the federal retirement system of the American government. All members of our military, our executive branch, the intelligence community, State Department, Pentagon, the White House, not to mention every member of Congress. They're holding 32 Chinese companies, if they have any international exposure, which virtually all of them do, and those 32 Chinese companies are, in some cases, 
bad actors themselves. Do you have a choice? Do they say, do you, can, you, can you check a box that says, no Chinese, please? No. It's automatic. They're in indexes. There's only one index that governs the international fund of the thrift savings plan. You see how that works, right? So that's where we sit in terms of a subject that's never seen the light of day until we went public with our research in March of 2019. And even the folks in this room, for the most part, have never heard about this issue before. Even though it's trillions with a T of dollars that have moved from the investment and hard earned retirement accounts of average folks into the coffers of the Chinese Communist Party and its corporate proxies. And those are the incontrovertible facts of the case. Now, it's bad enough that we have these unbelievable human rights and national security violations among those companies, even, as I say, officially sanctioned companies, for goodness sake. But let's look at it from a pure investor protection point of view, from a fiduciary point of view. Let's use market lingo and talk about the markets for a minute. Well, I'm, I'm fine with that. Not one Chinese company of those near 5,000 in the United States capital markets are compliant with U.S. federal securities laws. Not one. None of them are subject to government audits. That was waived by the Biden and Obama administration in May of 2013. A very convenient little sidebar uh, that, uh, that meant that China receives preferential treatment over their American and other foreign counterparts. This is, it sounds unbelievable, but this is a fact, right? There's no material risk disclosure. Gee, how can you list if there's no disclosure? There's no publication of their financials, which they regard as state secrets. What? How do you do a credit assessment? How do you make an informed investment decision? No corporate governance. Gee, I think we were supposed to care about corporate governance, right? ESG and all that. No rule of law, meaning no legal recourse. No diligence or risk management. No shareholder rights. Do I need to go on? Black boxes. That's it. You don't know, have no idea of what's happening with these companies. And now with this new espionage law put into force two or three weeks ago, what are they doing? They're killing what le what's left of the diligence search. They shut down the two biggest databases used by Wall Street, wind information and cap vision. Bye-bye. Then they raided Bain and Company, Deloitte, and the Mintz Group. Why? Because they had the temerity to ask questions about, gee, who are these companies? I guess they don't want us to know, right? So again, human rights, national security, investor protection. It all fits there. In one of those three categories, you'll find every abuse that you could possibly look at. I've tried to find others in the past 25 years that I've been working this thing and not found anything that, that skips those three. Now, so on forced labor, we tried an exercise that's in your packets today and is being made public today for the first time, at least by PSSI, and that's something that was made public by the Coalition for a Prosperous America, our a partner organization and friend, uh, about two weeks ago in the United States. They did the research and found 50 of China's largest companies who are known forced labor abusers, all footnoted for you to read the evidence, open source information. 
and then found that, that every one of them is in the indices and investment products of European and American exchanges. Gee, that's too bad, don't you think? That we're holding all those, right? Uh, we did some quick research at PSSI before the conference here, or the round table, I suppose, and what did we find? Well, we looked at Sweden, Netherlands, Japan, South Korea, Norway, and that's all we've found so far because we haven't had a lot of time. Between 8 and 18 of 50 of those 50 companies were in all of those portfolios. Sweden at 18, I might add. Now, these are the largest pension systems of those respective countries and among the largest pension systems in the world. And one G7 country wasn't amused, that's for sure, and basically said, uh, can you hold off on this for a while because we want to say goodbye to those companies about now. So if we're wondering whether this spurs concern over the corporate, rep over the, the, the reputation and brand of countries, much less the EU as an organization, I can assure you that they move to protect themselves darn quick on slave labor. That's encouraging because it means there is shame uh, still beneath profits and jobs and exports which usually prevail every time. So that's what we came out with so far, uh, with more to come. And all I would say is that we believe that if these companies, Chinese companies, were put at risk of accessing the U.S. and European exchanges where they raise funds, trade, and receive all the prestige for doing so, as I mentioned earlier, they might actually change their view on the efficacy of continuing with these heinous practices because they can't afford to have any contraction in their access to allied capital markets, particularly our own, which is around two-thirds of the world's investable capital. Our capital markets in the United States are roughly equivalent to the size of the rest of the world's combined, and we have the world's reserve currency, uh, and you, so, does, so does Europe and the euro. So the point is, we're packing the gear in the ally, in the allies on this subject. We utterly dominate the global financial domain on this planet. China doesn't have a convertible currency. If they don't have those hundreds of billions of dollars a year, the CCP cannot remain a going concern. They can't achieve a politically tenable growth rate. And it starts to be adios muchacho to CCP rule. So I would merely suggest to you that we have here a capital markets sanctions tool that's never been taken for a spin by Europe once in history. Why not now? And why can't the Czech Republic take a lead in this? It, it, it has the right government. <laughs> it's got the right sentiments. You heard them uh, live just, just moments ago. I just believe that if the Czechs were to be the ones that said, no, we're going to defund corporate labor, uh, forced labor abusers, and we are not, we're going to name names. 
We want to name every Chinese company that's involved in trafficking and forced labor. Those two acts alone could transform the European landscape on human rights. It would be the greatest nightmare for Beijing, Wall Street, and in the US, the Departments of Treasury, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the National Economic Council, that because of the revolving door with Wall Street, are largely conflicted. You can't have these economic and financial agencies of government ruling the roost with the security community and the human rights community off to the side, or we're going to get another 20 years of total non-transparency and scandal. And I'll just close with, with one sentence. I believe that this is the greatest geostrategic financial scandal in history, whereby, in our case, a democracy, notably the US, has engaged in the multi-trillion dollar funding of a totalitarian police state utterly bent on its destruction, aided and abetted by greed-driven Wall Street firms and often conflicted U.S. government regulators at Treasury, the SEC, and the National Economic Council. Now, this pains me to say this, but after almost 50 years in this business and having been to the rodeo on the Soviet takedown, I can tell you it's so. And we now have a chance to finally say no. This is our money. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Robinson, for reminding us of the scale of the complicity here. I think uh, sketching out the prime importance of fiduciary responsibility to trying to sort all of this out, but also for the clearest exposition I think I've ever heard of the dangers of doing business in China. It was an extraordinary uh, summary. But then I think also this very important and unused tool around capital markets, sanctions, and how that might be leveraged. And I think that leads us very nicely into the next part of this panel discussion, uh, where I'm going to pose a couple of questions, and please do be thinking of questions that you yourselves would like to ask the panelists, um, and then we're going to reflect. Now, one thing I don't think we do enough, those of us who are trying to campaign um, on China-related issues, is really stock take and assess where we have success. Um, in fact, we do a lot of doing the same things that we've always done that don't necessarily work. So I want to ask my panelists uh, today, where do you think we have seen the most movement? Where have we seen success? Or what tool in your work you found uh, most useful? I'm going to pose that to you, Louisa, first, if I may. Uh, thank you, Luke, for a very challenging question. Uh, often, in fact, uh, members of the Uyghur community, the constituent groups that belong to the World Uyghur Congress, <laughs> and Dolkin is taking a picture because Uyghur groups around the world are asking, what did they do today in Prague? Uh, and sometimes they ask, if anti-slavery groups or human rights committees in a chamber of deputy or a member of Congress in the U.S., um, says we must stop complicity, does that just mean you want to keep your own hands clean? Or are you also asking yourself, do you have leverage that in some way, combined with other actions, can change state behavior and actually save lives? Uh, and I do believe that that is where, for many years, um, <laughs> Uyghur campaigners said, there should be voices at the United Nations. We should give... Uh, substance to our commitments through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, through European 
values, you know, uh, all over the world, people who want to stand up for human rights. And the fact is that the financial pathways through which uh, the governments here in Europe, uh, U.S., Canada, and, so, and, and all supply chains, Australia, key example, are connected to the financial interests of government-linked entities and, frankly, officials and state-owned enterprises, uh, that is the place where uh, leverage can be obtained and where not only ending complicity is also leverage for change. Thank you. Roger, can I, can I come to you next? Yes. Uh, I would say that we had some notable successes in the United States so far on capital market sanctions. First, they were created from nowhere, right, after all these years. And we've had two presidential executive orders, one by Trump for the aficionados 13959 and Biden 14032, which basically were designed to make illegal the holding of the securities of Chinese military industrial companies and surveillance companies, which was a nod for the first time to human rights. Not complete, nearly enough, but something. And they called both presidents, in writing, signed by them, called such holdings a national emergency. Their words, not mine. And then, of course, proceeded to dilute that near out of existence. Biden waived the thing altogether when it came time to actually implement against a number of Chinese companies after the one-year grace period, uh, then waived it altogether. In the case of uh, the Trump administration, there was a better handling of it, but still, uh, it didn't come to much. I'll give you an example. Uh, the entity list of the Department of Commerce, also called the blacklist, right? It, it has, it, in a moment of time, it had 1,260 companies, Chinese, on there for egregious human rights and national security abuses. It's a sanction. They're denied, or it's the presumption of a denial to give them a license to sell American equipment and technology. So they're denied equipment and technology. Pretty big sanction, right? How many of those companies went on the Treasury Department OFAC list, Office of Foreign Assets Control, to impede their access to raise money and trade in the U.S. capital markets? Answer, 16. 16 out of 1,260. Now, how serious does that sound to you? When, in fact, it should be the case that a sanctioned U.S. a U.S. sanctioned Chinese company should automatically be out, excluded from access uh, to the U.S. capital markets. You can't list. You can't raise funds. You can't trade. You're out. It seems so straightforward, and yet. It, it begs the question, why? And the answer is the same old answer, protecting Wall Street fees and greed. It's not even exports and jobs uh, the way it is uh, here in Europe. Uh, it's not even uh, uh, as pragmatic as that. It, it, <laughs> It's a sad commentary. So, uh, but we did have something called the holding, another success was the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act. Mm. The good news about that was we got a, cons a, a unanimous vote in the House of Senate to, ex to delist any Chinese company that was not subject to a U.S. government audit, like every other company needs to be, within a three-year period. Three years. It might as well be 30 years, right? 
right there was engineered by Treasury to take the teeth out of the thing. But nevertheless, got that thing passed, nice touch, important from a capital markets point of view. But then we find out with the, in the small print, it covers 260 companies. New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ. Gee, where are those over the 900 over the counter uh, market companies? Where's the upwards to 4,000 A shares? So in other words, as usual, a narrow, diluted, eviscerated effort, which is the hallmark of this portfolio in the United States. Don't worry about Europe. The portfolio doesn't exist here. So we can't even watch it eroding. The first step hasn't been taken. So I know this sounds a little bit negative, <laughs> more than a little, but nevertheless, it is progress and the door has been opened. And the beauty of this thing is that the empirical facts are incontrovertible and you can't beat them with greed. Not when they're seeing the light of day in the way we plan to make sure they see the light of day. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, so Eva, if you could add a couple of thoughts on this. Uh, what tool have you found most useful in your work to raise awareness of forced labor, or where have you seen most success? Uh, I will add the point of view from the Central Europe, a political Central Europe. I think our most powerful tool is the awareness. And uh, I would like to remind what happened here in the last uh, 10 years, because the Czech Republic uh, succeeded to shift uh, from uh, really pro-Chinese uh, politics uh, on many aspects mm -hmm. to at least I say at least, but it's really important, awareness of the vulnerability, awareness and uh, readiness to tackle this issue. And uh, the, the simple fact that today, uh, I think the majority of the political scene is ready to open this subject, to speak about China as strategic uh, arrival, a strategic uh, risk. This is really, I think, from political point of view, the most powerful after all of these tools, uh, there, are, there are many of them. Uh, we have uh, spoke about, uh, about the screening, uh, but uh, the fact uh, that, uh, for example, uh, or maybe the, uh, the success, if you speak not about tool, but about success, uh, it's our close relationship with Taiwan. It was not something automatic. It needed to be built. It needed, at some point, uh, again, the political courage to go there, even, the Ch even if China was budding and uh, really uh, putting pressure. So uh, I think awareness and uh, opening mind of uh, political actors today uh, helped uh, to know that uh, China is no more friend. Huh? And, uh, I think this, uh, this is the start point. Uh, it may look that uh, it's not enough from the point of view what was done, uh, what was done in the United States, but uh, here from the middle of Central Europe, uh, it's really important. Thank you very much, um, Eva. I, I would agree with that. I think just adding a thought from my perspective, both in the UK and with international politicians, um, the greatest success has been in reframing the debate around China. And that's happened because we've tried to create an ecosystem between the research community, the media, and politicians, and create a system where they all feed one another. So there was a load of research about forced sterilization, and that fed a lot of media interest. And then there was a lot of parliamentary activity, for example, in genocide motions that went through, I think, 11 parliaments now. Many of our members were involved in those. And that became a, a sort of an awareness-raising ecosystem which has shifted thinking about China. No question. It has made a difference, but not as concrete a difference as we need. You know, we're not seeing the corresponding policy and legislative change. And as the past month has shown, 
Uh, we've done a kind of two steps forward in terms of awareness raising, and it's one step back right now with this general posture of rapprochement towards China, which is what we're having to endure at the moment, particularly in the UK. Uh, this moves me on to my second question, and after this I'm going to come to the floor. What does our panel think is the principal obstacle to the adoption of stronger human rights due diligence regulations, and that can be in the EU or beyond? What do we think is the main obstacle? What's really standing in the way? Um, can I come to you first on that? Roger, would that be okay? Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> For those who didn't hear it the first time. No, I, I, it's right up there. In, in the case of Europe, the greatest obstacles are, um, are uh, exports and jobs and uh, corporate ties to China. What we might say in shorthand is the BMW and Airbus sales writ large. And uh, that is a very powerful deterrent. Um, and almost a kind of vestige of us politique, which has been, I hope, thoroughly discredited for history in the case of our German friends. And what a pathetic display they put on over the past decades in this regard. And uh, we're still trying to play the same game uh, with the Chinese when it's so over, it's not funny, as they would say, uh, believing that greater commercial and financial ties will somehow miraculously lead to greater political pluralism and geopolitical harmony. I mean, it almost sounds so trite uh, but nevertheless, folks are still hiding behind that. And so that's the big one. And um, in the U.S., uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's a Wall Street thing. It's a, uh, the fees are gigantic. And uh, the CCP will give, will give the holy grail, if they need to, to BlackRock and J.P. Morgan Chase and uh, others, uh, the vanguards of the world, by giving them what they really want. And what they really want is they, the, the U.S. market's becoming saturated with investment products. Little did we know. And they don't have lots of room for, for growth. And the spreads are getting very thin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and everything's so congested. What these folks want more than anything else is to get into the Chinese market and replicate what they've done to the United States, but this time with the regular Chinese people and their institutions and the belief that somehow they're going to be cut loose with those billion, 300, 400 million people, and all of a sudden they're going to replicate in multiples what they achieved in the United States, and those fees are just going to explode off of the map. I mean, that's what they want. And they will sell their mothers to get it, to put it bluntly. So, so much for human rights and national security, and even fiduciary responsibility. And so, I'm sorry to say that these, uh, these elements of the human condition, as unpleasant as they are, are uh, the explanation from my perspective and uh, the way we combat that is uh, two ways. In the parlance of the markets, we finally found two entry points where human rights and national security, the entire portfolio is going to be stuffed in two concepts that are market concepts. One is called risk, and the other is called corporate reputation and brand. The risks of doing business with China have gone through the roof, need I say. I mean, God bless President Xi is a one-man wrecking ball for the CCP vis-a-vis -vis the markets. That's the one really good thing he's done. And, uh, and so that's, you know, that, that's, in a sense, where we sit. And uh, 
The other is corporate reputation and brand. Funds, I mean, BlackRock and Vanguard do not want to be known as associated with genocidal murders. They're not keen to be thought of as aiding and abetting traffickers in slave labor, or equipping concentration camps, or constructing the surveillance uh, state that gives rise to the rest. Uh, and we need to make sure that they're wearing that moniker, starting now, if that's what it takes. And I, and I can tell you that I believe, over time, the more we get this data out, the more these facts surface, it's going to be a bridge too far for them. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Louisa, uh, coming to you, if I may, on this, the main obstacles to progress. It's Wall Street, so here's my story. I, four years ago, my, you know, NGO worker, retirement account, I went to them and I said, I, 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 can you please assure me that there are no, I actually said no Chinese companies because most of them are tech companies, right, the most easily available, and they all, at a minimum, engage in censorship, whether you're Baidu or any kind of portal, right, there is, there is no freedom of speech, so I, I went to censorship as my bottom line, uh, as well as, of course, uh, participating in uh, misinformation efforts and certainly benefiting from uh, un trade that involves uh, some the, the surveillance tech to construct the genocide, literally billion dollar contacts, contracts for the big Chinese telecoms and surveillance tech companies, S cash money from the Xinjiang government to build out the system, collect the uh, data, uh, for the system. So I, I said, you know, can you assure me? And basically, the people whose job it is to provide good sound investment advice to somebody in their mid-career basically didn't believe me. And they said, well, all right, let's see, how do we give you international exposure? You know, you have to have good balance in your portfolio and you have to have, uh, you know, emerging markets. You know, and then I said, yes, but I can't have any. I don't, I don't, and they said, well, you know, it's only in, we can give you this index fund, and I said, I want, what's in it? And then they finally came back and told me what was in it, and they said, well, you know, it's really only $236 because it's a, you know, 0.00% of 0 0.00, and I said, I don't care. So basically, in the advisors whose job it is to help, and you can check, I don't want tobacco, I don't want guns. And you can even do a human rights thing. That's all very flawed. They couldn't believe me. So I believe there might have been a, I did this. It took me four months of back and forth to literally. And then they finally said, I guess you can't be in the merger markets. And I said, I guess I can't if you can't give me any other investment in Mexico or some other place that you call emerging markets. Um, so that grip of that ideology, which comes from the top at BlackRock because it is in their interest to get in to offer products to the retail Chinese savers, who are great savers. I mean, it's a wonderful virtue of Chinese society. People save money. <laughs> and they know that, you know, they did real estate, and that didn't turn out too well for them. Um, so I do believe that it's, it's not only the in financial interests of Wall Street that gets truly their hundreds of millions like that, um, all the way down through the investment professionals, the, uh, the, um, the mindset that they've been taught. And I therefore want to say that is a huge, huge, huge obstacle. Thank you. And finally to Eva on that one. Um, what's getting in our way? To, I will be very general because uh, I think these obstacles uh, are valid uh, everywhere, uh, but uh, they are really important. For me, there are three of them. Uh, lie, fear, opportunism. I think uh, after that we may speak about, uh, about kind of cynicism and uh, um, Proved, uh, and uh, you just uh, you just spoke about about it, uh, Louisa. Uh, of course, we use uh, bureaucracy uh, to explain why something it's not possible. But also, one of the one of the obstacles why uh, Germany or others uh, other states are not able to move uh, forward uh, 
it's also the way how the policy uh, in, in Europe, in America is working because uh, the, the leaders, they need to have the support from their communities. They need to prove that their people are happy. So it's sometimes difficult to explain for them uh, that it's important to care also uh, about the if the Uyghurs people are happy. And I think what we need to explain, and this is something we still miss, we, uh, we are not able to explain it uh, here or somewhere else, uh, that uh, if the Uyghurs people or Muslim people or uh, everywhere uh, other on the, in the world uh, are threatened or are really uh, or suffer, uh, it's also our problem, it's the problem of our security. And after that, I think we are able if, uh, to explain that uh, if somewhere else uh, the human rights are violated in this way, this is our problem because if they are able to do it there, they are able to do it here. So uh, it's the question who's the next. Uh, and uh, this is something uh, in German or somewhere else uh, here as well, we are not able to explain to, or maybe not enough. I spoke before about awareness. This is maybe first step. The next step uh, is to explain that it's not only to be aware of the risk, but also to be aware that uh, it's our problem. It's uh, our problem of our security and happiness of our electors, of our population. And the fact that uh, our population are not able to listen to that or we are not able to explain as, uh, as leaders uh, after we are not uh, ready to take the policies, which looks so easy when, uh, when we hear it. Of course, it's logical, but, uh, but this is, I think, where, why we are where we, where, where we are. Thank you, Eva. Okay, I'm going to come to the floor just shortly after adding a, a couple of very brief reflections uh, myself. I, I think that the principal obstacle we're facing probably is capacity. It's a lot of work, as people who have been campaigning will know. It's a lot of work to force an issue like this into the public discourse. And if you think that right now we have a war in Europe, in Ukraine, there is a query genocide in northern Nigeria, there is another genocide possibly in Sudan at the moment. I've said nothing about Myanmar or many other places where there are huge human rights crises. Um, you have to <laughs> consider that you're kind of fighting against those in order to get any public airtime whatsoever. Um, so capacity is, a, a, I think, a, a big issue. Right, let's open the floor to questions. Is there anybody who would like to pose a question to any of the panelists today? Just raise your hand and I'll, I'll pick you up. Over here, thank you. Thank you. Uh, please allow me to frame my question. We are in the midst of geopolitical conflict that might very well come to a kinetic war. And we have seen what the hastily implementations of sanctions and decoupling can do to our economy when it came to war with Russia and Ukraine. I don't think that there is a way other than the direct that the companies will abide to our regulations. They need to be forced, they need to be directed. And the later we do it, the greater will be the cost of this direction. So, are we able to do it? Are we able to direct our companies to decouple from China, to decouple from that market, before it might come to kinetic war? Because we are running out of time. Mr. Xi Jinping said that before 2027, the China will have ready forces and capabilities to invade Taiwan. And by 2030, they will take it. This gives us a pretty short window of opportunity to strengthen our economy and decouple from China. Are we able to do that? And are we able, for example, to compensate our companies for their loss of revenue? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Could you just identify who you are? Sorry. I'm sorry, I would prefer not to say name. Okay, no worries. All right. So, uh, decoupling by choice now or forced decoupling later? Uh, what does our panel think? Uh, Eva, can I come to you first? Of course, the decoupling now. Now, the thing is that we are again... Uh, I don't think that the way it's to really uh, give instruction to the companies. We saw it in Czech Republic. Uh, 
the, for me, the way is, of course, the, the, of the regulation of... Uh, uh, but before we forbid, forbid that to the, to the European companies to, do, to be in the China, we need to build something here. And I think we are here at this stage. This is the moment that it's quite easy. Uh, and I think uh, as, as at least what I know, even the Czech companies which were active uh, in the Chinese markets today, they're coming back. Because if you are business, uh, businessman, it's not really safe for you to, to be on the place where no rules uh, are working. You do, not, you do not know what will be tomorrow, uh, for, at which price you buy or you sell. But the thing is that, uh, first of all, we need to build the infrastructure here. And I think if my answer is do it now, of course we have to do it now, but uh, you don't do it tomorrow. You are not able uh, to build chip factory uh, in one year because first of all, you need to, uh, to have the people able to, to, to produce it. So, uh, and this is again, Czech Republic, I think is really good in it because uh, we work uh, how to educate the people directly with the, or to be educated by the Taiwanese in order to be able to produce chip here. Because even if you build tomorrow chip factory here, if you have no people uh, to work in it, uh, so of course do it today, of course to do it through measures uh, and support of the companies coming uh, here and uh, be able uh, to replace uh, the Chinese infrastructure. But I think that uh, to be, we don't to have uh, think that uh, it will not be uh, done uh, at once. Uh, and uh, as I see, uh, we are already on this way. We are on the way of decoupling. Thank you. Um, Roger, I'll come to you if I may. Is, is decoupling between the US and China even possible? Well, as uh, I um, will answer it from the point of view of the capital markets, I, I think the question's inspired. Um, it's certainly the one that's on the table first and foremost for the Congress. And uh, it's on the minds of the House Select Committee on China, uh, which is holding a hearing that I'll be testifying before next Wednesday. And the chairman of that committee, Mike Gallagher, has the following theory and one I share. If the DPP wins in Taiwan in January of next year, 24, and uh, then basically, and if China is not bouncing back, as we're noticing, and many of us predicted, uh, they're going to start to fall into a slow motion economic and financial implosion which in a sense they're in now. They grew last year at 2%, don't believe the three. Uh, this is a total disaster for these guys. They have to grow at 6%, or it's, again, the sun's setting for them in the West, right? It's a big, I mean, it's an untenable problem over time. So I think they're going to be, they're not gonna solve their real estate problem. <laughs> I mean, and not to mention the debt problem of 300% plus of GDP, the list goes on. The weakness of the Chinese communist, I mean, the Chinese uh, right now economy is, is pretty breathtaking. And we'll, we may have a chance to talk about that, I don't know. But leave it to say that if you take the Taiwan election, combine it with an economic and financial peril that I think they're gonna be in where they need to change the subject for a nationalist revival and campaign. My bet, and Chairman Gallagher's bet, is that they're gonna declare the next DPP president has gone too far, even though he won't have uttered a syllable more than has already taken place to date. But they're gonna claim that he's crossed a red line and in a de facto declaration of independence. In July, August, September of 24, 2024, is the period of maximum danger because they want six more months of the Biden administration. I won't use some of the, uh, how do I, leave it to say that they, 
the Chinese are not anxious to, th to throw the dice on the next president. It's like having Jimmy Carter as president and saying, I think we'll wait for this new guy, Ronald Reagan. That would be a bad bet, right? So you want to go with a fairly weak president and a n certainly not remotely war cabinet like Tony Blinken, Lloyd Austin, uh, Jake Sullivan. Nice enough people, but a war cabinet they're not. Putting it mildly. So this is upon us. And it's true that there's trillions with a T in exposure of the American people, investor community, uh, to China, these 5,000 Chinese companies, not to mention the Chinese government and its issuance of, of sovereign bonds in the United States. Anyway, uh, m my hope is, and by the way, a kinetic war with the United States is the electrocution of China in the cap markets. Wall Street will not be able to keep their fingers in those holes in the dike anymore. Uh, but we'll take horrific losses. The idea of compensating BlackRock and Vanguard and all these for their losses is out of the question. I mean, if they fail, fine. Uh, they're the ones that uh, built this uh, veil of tears, and they can live with it, is my attitude toward them. But, uh, but I do worry about the unwitting 150 million Americans. And that's why decoupling has to take place now. 2023 is the harvest in this regard, and 24. I see five pieces of legislation coming down the pike that will de facto mean decoupling in the financial sector. One is uh, it's going to be against the law to be holding sanctioned Chinese companies. Mm -hmm. Two, it's going to be against the law to issue dollar-denominated Chinese sovereign bonds in the United States. These are CCP anti-liberty bonds. I mean, liberty bonds helped us win World War I and World War II. Now we're financing our demise with anti-liberty bonds. That's not going to play. Three, we're going to eliminate A shares. They're unregulated, they're, they're opaque, and they're bad guys. And there's nearly 4,000 of them in our markets. In one fell swoop, you're going to say goodbye A shares. And that is a big part of the problem gone right there, the biggest. Then you've got the variable interest entities. These frauds in the uh, Cayman Islands, you know, not one American owns one share of one Chinese company in reality. Why? 95% of them are set up as variable interest entities in the Caymans, which means that they're, they're shell companies selling shares of contracts supposedly infused by Alibaba shares. I mean, it's, a, it's the most scandalous mechanism because China, here's a little secret, doesn't allow foreigners to hold the real shares of their company. Did you know that? No, I suspect not, right? Imagine. So kiss VIEs goodbye. And then TSP, our Federal Thrift Savings Plan, you can kiss goodbye those 32 companies. Uh, Rubio and others will see to that. And then we have to expand the scope of the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act. It's a little technical, but leave it to say, I see five or six pieces of legislation coming down the pike that will have more than a modest amount to do with that when implemented will radically cut back the exposure of the American people on an accelerated basis and give us time to make a good slug of this adjustment. There's going to be pain, big pain anyway. But I'd rather have it be a 100 basis point rise in interest rates for six months than to see, you know, multi-trillion dollar losses. So it is, correctly put, we are at that crossroads right now.
And I think that we can persuade the Congress with this unprecedented bipartisan consensus that is distinctly anti-China right now to step up for the American people and end this scandalous fraud once and for all. Thank you very much. Louisa, did you want to add anything to that? No, I just think it's a great question, and, and how do you persuade people? Because if people are hurting from the sanctions on Russia and they have the war weariness, and you know, it's not winter now, but there will be another winter. So it's, maybe you can do it with charts, where you have a, you know, somebody scoped out the numbers and really tried to compare how much pain the average household faces. But data sometimes doesn't persuade voters and, and parties standing in the polls. Mm -hmm. So it truly is uh, the right question to be asking and to experiment how can, you know, politicians like <laughs> corporations are, are looking to short-term results always, right? I mean, it's the next election, trying to stand up for the future of our country, trying to take the long view, how did our country and our continent survive, um, you know, uh, the threats of, of fascism and Soviet, you know, and communist threats over these, an entire, you know, the last century. So there may be a way to bring a long-term view. I know, you know, the, the people hosting us today are the ones who can evoke that effectively with your own voters. Um, and for other people, maybe data will make a difference, but I completely agree. Give it a try. Um, it's very hard to let people look that far in the future and um, certainly support that effort. Okay, uh, we have been going for well over an hour and we are scheduled to go on for another 15 minutes. I think I'll take one more question and then wrap up. This gentleman over here, was there anybody else who's really burningly trying to ask a question? Uh, no, okay, please come forward. Hi, my name is uh, Tor Stumo. I'm a family member of one of the next panelists. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank you guys for uh, all your work and your advocacy against genocide and, and slavery and, uh, you know, with tens of millions of people. Um, my, my question's a little different. It's, um, I'm wondering about the Chinese Communist Party's motivation for committing these atrocities. Uh, what, is, you know, what is the importance to China of this forced labor? And more importantly, um, and in a way separately, what is so crucial about the genocide and subjugation of the Uyghur people? Um, what, what is so beneficial to China about these things and, and how hard are they willing to fight against our punishing financial sanctions, governmental penalties and diplomacy uh, to, to keep these programs going? What is it going to take uh, to stop this? Um, and what is even so, so I mean, beneficial about this in the first place, you know, in a concrete sense to China. Thank you. Okay, Louisa, I think I better come to you for that one. Um, why are they doing it? Yes, well, please think about it yourself, Luke. I know you, you also addressed this question. I will also give um, Dolkanis a chance if he has a thought about what people should think about this. Certainly there's the economic dimension of Xi Jinping's signature vision for the next stage of China's growth, which is to global in our interconnectivity through the Belt and Road, through using some uh, uh, capacity uh, to do infrastructure projects across the Eurasian continent, um, to expand access to ports, um, through a kind of a mercantilist view, right? We need to have access to agricultural land directly in Africa, not quite trusting the market, maybe not quite trusting the fact that the world will, um, you know, allow the People's Republic of China truly to be able to, have, you, to rely on the market to supply needs for goods and services all over the world, which is what we always hope market forces will do for everyone. Um, and so therefore the need to, you know, what is in between the main heartland of China and the Eurasian landmass from gas to, um, you know, railroads to the, to the um, Indian Ocean and so on. Well, the Uyghur homeland is in between. And so subduing that area, being able to build across it, um, required, requires both a sure hand that there won't be disruption and unrest, uh, and also, you know, some of it may be, some of it may be um, 
you could say reasons of state, and some of it is simply nationalist delusion, where the, the, the triumph over a conflicting narrative that there may be um, a people, uh, a nation of people, for example, the Uyghurs, who um, have a loyalty other than to the Communist Party. And, uh, you know, their grievances, unhappiness, wish to protest being treated unfairly um, is somehow a, a threat to the state itself. And by thinking that, the Communist Party's leading ideologists make it so. So it's a self it's a self-creating uh, idea of a threat to the party's rule and to somehow their vision of the Chinese nation. Um, and then there is a, a labor shortage. I don't think that's a driving force. So Dolkin, you can feel free to ch ch chime in if I, I've missed a key point. Dolkin, do you want to say a few words about motivation? You don't want to? Okay. Um, right, well, I think just adding to that, the, the, eth the ethno-nationalism of the, of, of the Chinese state, uh, well-known, well-documented, the principle um, or the uh, tradition of Han chauvinism, although it may manifest uh, slightly differently within the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party now, is very well established. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty clear uh, to most observers that uh, that is a strong aspect to the persecutions as well. Right, I think I'd better wrap things up for today. Um, first of all, just to thank my panel for their contributions. Thank you all uh, for sitting through what was a very long panel, but I hope a very rich one. I, uh, during our discussion, was drawing up a SWOT analysis. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody in this room has done one of those. It's where it's a kind of analytical tool where you try to set out the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of your own uh, position. And that's why I asked the questions I was asking. And what was interesting to me was that in the threat column, nobody said the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, the answers we had were Wall Street, greed, fear, opportunism, and then my answer, capacity. And I think those things are instructive. I think they tell us that we do have the tools uh, because we need to look within in order to be able to confront this challenge. It's not merely outside looking in. It's not merely the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing bearing down on us. It's inside uh, looking out. So I do think we've got a couple of outcomes here. I, I do think that we all agreed um, of the principal importance of maintaining public and political awareness of these issues, not just on the severity of the abuses, which continue, by the way, if anybody tries to tell you otherwise, but also on the possible solutions to it. And on that point, I thought we heard very eloquently from all of our panelists, but particularly to use the tools available to us in collaboration with our allies, making sure that the tools that help us to assess and manage risk throughout our business supply chains are used. They're not used now. That the tools which exist to help us embarrass companies to bring to the fore their corporate reputations are used. I think if we were able to deploy these things, we'd be in a much stronger position than we are today. But I'm very well aware from my perspective in trying to do this work internationally that it cannot be done by one nation alone. It must be done in collaboration uh, with allies. And I think that's the aspect that needs a lot more development. So it just remains for me to thank our panel, uh, to thank our hosts, to thank you, and I'll conclude it there. Thank you, everyone.